Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Handwoven, Piecework, Spinoff, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. This episode is sponsored by Trainway Silks. You'll find the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trainwaysilks.com. Choose from a rainbow of hand-dyed colors. Love natural? Their array of wild silk and silk blends provide choices beyond white. Trainway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. I'm your host, Longthread Media co-founder, Ann Marrow. You may not know Amy Norris by name, but if you've taken a class at a regional weaving conference, asked a question and found an answer on weave tech, or tried your hand at the chorus effect, you probably know her work. Amy, you have been talking to weavers on the internet since before most people knew what the internet was. Do I understand that you're one of the founders of Weave Tech? I am, in fact, one of the founders of Weave Tech. I was on the main weaving list, which was a major domo list back in, I joined in like 98, something around 1998. And at that time, there was a bit of a kerfluffle and I got elected list mom. They called it list mom. And I was list mom for a little while and I got celebrated at Convergence in Atlanta after that. I got a lovely book with all these handwritten cards, something that probably wouldn't happen anymore, but it was lovely. But then right around that same time, the weaving list got very concerned that people who were weaving on computer assisted looms like AVLs weren't really weavers. And even though we kept explaining to them that if we sat down at the computer aided loom, Nothing happened if we didn't press the treadle and throw the shuttle. There was enough controversy, let's just call it that, that a group of about 12 of us said, you know what, let's create a new list where we know from day one that this is okay. And Laura Fry and Lori Audio and Ruth Blau and Marco and many of the names that you would recognize in the weaving circles today We're all on that list and we hashed out all the rules. There wasn't going to be any selling. And then and Ruth Blau, who at the time uh, was a very active weaver in Washington, D.C. area, uh, and I became we called ourselves the list administrators because we did not want to be list moms. We neither of us were interested in mothering the other people on there. And that was in around 2000. And I'm still the co-administrator, only I'm now the sole administrator of Weave Tech. I've been doing it for 21 years. And uh, we have moved from major domo to another major domo to I don't even remember to Yahoo groups. And now we're on groups IO. And the rules have never changed, which is you know, be polite, be respectful, and weaving with a computer-aided loom is still welcome and encouraged. Like, who gets to decide who's a real weaver? <laughs> well, it's this akin to the discussion that comes up also from time to time about whether what we do is art or craft. And that's something that you and I could talk about for the next, oh, I don't know, 16,000 days. And there's no resolution. It's whatever you want it to be. As far as I'm concerned, Everybody's a real weaver. It doesn't matter what kind of your equipment is. If you're making cloth, you're a real weaver. A kerfuffle on an internet community. I can't imagine. I <laughs> ever heard of such a thing. For a while, we actually had a schedule. Ruth and I, when we were co-list moms, we had a schedule because we found that at the same time of year, every year, the same things erupted. It was the warping back to front versus warping front to back. That one would come up or the you can't weave with knitting yarns would come up. And it was like it came up every year. It was pretty funny. So it's not specifically for weaving with a computer aided loom, but that sort of weaving is welcomed? Yes, absolutely. We take anybody what we don't. Well, I was going to say we encourage not beginners because beginners used to have another strong list. Now, I'm not really sure what's happened to that weaving list. And quite frankly, I don't police the people joining other than to make sure we don't get any spammers. But we encourage people, you know, not to jump in with, hey, I just heard about weaving and I want to start. Where do I go? There's a lot of other resources for that. We try to be the resource for the person who is trying to do something more intermediate, something where there isn't a lot of other resources. YouTube is a great place. Now, Facebook has thousands and thousands of weavers and lots of groups where people ask and answer questions. And we try to be the the next level up for the people who have questions that aren't easily answered elsewhere. 
you mentioned, and I saw on the Weave Tech list, that it is primarily for intermediate and advanced weavers. It is really hard in weaving to assess what level people are. You know, how do you describe if you're a beginning weaver or an advanced weaver? I know very few people who would describe themselves as advanced weavers. That is true. And I will say that over the years, putting on a different hat of non-internet stuff, when I've been organizer for workshops, we've sort of come up with some generalized criteria. And that is a beginning weaver really can be anybody. An intermediate weaver knows how to read a draft, knows how to warp their loom, knows at least a little bit about a couple of different structures. Maybe it's just plain weave and twill, but that's enough. And then advanced weavers are people who can create their own drafts, who are willing to take a look at not the most popular or most well represented in literature structures. Those are the people that are perhaps what I would call advanced. I do call myself an advanced weaver. And that's sort of how I define it. It's somebody who is doing a step beyond recipe weaving and is familiar with some of the lesser known structures. That is something that we wrestle with in handwoven. It is really hard to put an actual label on it. I agree. And I will often, if somebody is interested in taking a workshop, I will talk to them and just get a feel. And then I can sort of group them with the beginners, the intermediates or the advanced. But you're right. It's extremely difficult to come up with black and white This is who you are. That's why I say for Weave Tech, we try to be the resource for the questions that are not easily accessible other places. And we are frequent. I mean, it's happening less now because it's a less active list. But back in the day when we had over a thousand messages a month, we were free to direct people to other resources like the master yarn list that Handwoven has always had, because how many times can you answer, what should I set this yarn at? You know, and that's also, as Laura Fry would say, it's an it depends kind of answer. It depends on what you're going for. So we would send them to a more commonly accessible resource and then have them come back with, OK, and now I want to refine that a little bit beyond just what's printed as the average. And then we're happy to talk more about it. So, yeah, that's the challenge is how to encourage the new weavers who feel overwhelmed and bring it to something that they can digest and get excited about. And then also how to continue to foster the intermediate and advanced weavers who've done all of the easy stuff and don't quite know where to go next. So you mentioned in the offline world that you work on placing people in classes. I don't tend to see your name very much on the teaching list. Have I missed that or do you tend to work more on the organizing side? I'm on the organizing side. I've been on the Midwest Weavers Association board for almost 20 years. I am on the Complex Weavers board and I've been on the Complex Weavers board for a long time. And I've been active in my local guild as well for almost 30 years. I don't teach much. I have taught. It's a very simple fact that I have a full-time day job and I don't have a lot of vacation. And I like to take my vacation and go learn things. So this summer, I'll be taking vacation to go to the Complex Weaver Seminars in Knoxville and take a couple days for convergence. I am an avid workshop attendee and conference attendee. So that's basically where my vacation has gone for family and weaving events for 30 years. And uh, so I do teach a little bit, but that's just not a big part of my portfolio right now. And you and I first met at SOAR, which is, of course, a spinning conference. So you are not just a weaver, but also a spinner. That's true. I started actually as a knitter. I was a knitter. And the the infamous story is that my mother taught me to knit, but she never taught me to purl. So I had to go away to school to learn how to purl. (laughs) But I started knitting and purling in my college days. And I knew from a very early age that I was intrigued by weaving. So when I graduated from college, I moved to St. Louis, Missouri and saw that there was a a weaving store not far from me, took my first weaving workshop, my first intro to weaving, learning to weave workshop on an old Leclerc Dorothy table loom, which for anybody who's been around a while knows that those are knuckle busters, but a whole generation of us learned on them anyway, and then bought my first loom, which I'm still using to this day, a Harrisville four shaft kit loom that I strapped to the top of my car and took to my studio apartment. And that was it for weaving for me. I've been weaving ever since. Now later, about 10 years later, I had been around enough weavers who were spinners that I thought, oh, that looks like fun. So I, then I took up spinning, but I spin purely for relaxation and pleasure. I have no aspirations to do anything other than just enjoy myself. I have woven for a lot of other reasons, like for sale and commissions and things like that. But spinning is just sheer fun. So you mentioned Complex Weaver Seminars, which is coming up. 
I've never been to complex weaver seminars. I've only been to convergence once. How did those things work together? I've always been a little bit confused about that. Well, they're very different kinds of events. Convergence is a very, what I would consider a very wide spectrum, has appeal to a variety, not only a variety of weavers, but a variety of disciplines because they also include knitting and dyeing. And there's usually a few sort of peripheral things with a little jewelry making. I know at Convergence in Tampa, I took a beading class. There's sometimes some felting, sometimes some basketry. So it's pretty diverse in terms of the media that's covered and also the levels. There'll be everything from a hands-on, make it and take it, making a, a little square woven brooch flower thing to a three-day in-depth workshop on a multi-chef loom. And so it's, it's a much broader spectrum of offerings. Complex Weaver Seminars is different in two main respects, I would say. First of all, the content is much more narrow. It is weaving and weaving only, although that can include the history of weaving in other parts of the world. This summer, there's somebody presenting on Egyptian Coptic weaving. And also that the teachers are also members of complex weavers. And a lot of time what they're presenting is sort of in process or in development. It's not something that they take out on the road and market as a workshop for guilds. It's more like this is the exploration that I've been on for the last few years and I would like to share it with you. So it's a little bit different atmosphere. The seminars, the registration includes five slots and each one of them is, it's a lecture only format. It's not hands-on and it is structured so that it's fairly intense and short, if that makes any sense. So it sounds like, like a guild for people who do a particular kind of weaving who just get together every couple of years. And that's that sort of community back and forth aspect. Yeah, I think so. I think I was part of the board at the time. We kind of redid our logo and our tagline. And one of the things that we focused on was weavers who have a strong sense of curiosity. Why is it this way? There's absolutely nothing wrong with somebody who is weaving for the purpose of having the end product. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with the people who would like to take a handwoven magazine, see a pretty picture and weave that item. Those are completely admirable weaving goals. And Complex Weavers is a little bit more for the person who is like, I don't know why these thread interlacements do this. What happens if I do that? A little more curiosity, experimental, and wanting to expand their knowledge beyond, I really want a towel and I want it to be in these colors. That said, almost all of my samples are actually what we I call myself a member of the full size sample group. I just make lots of towels and their samples for other things. In fact, I just pulled a batch off my loom. I've seen you prepare for a guild sale and I think you just brought a whole stack of towels and sat there and hemmed your towels and ironed your towels, made a lot of towels. It's one of the great things that towels provide. It's a rectangle, so I don't have to spend a lot of time finishing two hems and I'm done. And at the same time, I can delude myself into thinking I'm being productive when I'm really just experimenting with colors or with weave structure. And the worst thing that happens is something that really is only good for cleaning up cat messes. It's still functional. <laughs> um, if I'm lucky, I can turn around and either give it as a gift or sell it to somebody else. But it somehow just deludes me into thinking I'm being more productive than I am. So you mentioned that you're still using your Harrisville foreshaft, but tell me about your biggest loom. Well, the biggest loom could be defined by the most complex loom or by the physically largest. So I started with the four shaft Harris film, which, yes, is still weaving, although I've had to put more bolts in it to keep it from weaving apart. And then I got an eight shaft ABL home loom, which is 48 inches wide. And then I went really big and I got a 16 shaft AVL. It's one of the early CompuDobbies. And I bought it from Sharon Alderman when she was upgrading to something else. It's a 60-inch loom, so it is physically my largest. It's got a footprint the same as a king-size bed. However, not my most complex, because what I had my eye on and did not think I was going to be able to get until I retired, I lucked into a few years ago, and that's an AVL 40 shaft. It's only 24 inches wide, so physically it's smaller but it is the most complex loom that I own. And I think it's probably the most complex loom that I could handle mentally. One of the things I learned very quickly is more shafts does not necessarily equal better designs. 
it just gives me more room to make really bad designs too. So I spend as much time now or more time now weaving, quote, on the computer, trying to get the designs that I want before I take it to the loom. And then even then, I'm often disappointed with the way it turns out or have ideas for the way it it needs to be uh, rejiggered to be a little bit better. But complexity in weaving in terms of the number of shafts and the available permutations of those shafts is not the end point. And I I say that to people very deliberately because a lot of times people think, well, you're a good weaver because you have so many shafts. And the answer there is absolutely not. If somebody wants to call me a good weaver, it's because I weave a lot, a lot of warps, a lot of warps over and over again. I design a lot of drafts and I throw a lot of them away. And yeah, it's practice. And then the bigger the loom, the more complex the loom anyway, the more room there is for both really great designs and really lousy designs. So just because you said you weave a lot, how much do you weave? Like, are you doing this every day? Do you buy your yarns by 10 pounds? What do you mean when you say that you weave a lot? Well, I will tell a story that early on in my friendship with John Malarkey, who I know you know is a a tablet weaver, he came to my studio. He had just taken his first floor loom weaving class at one of our local shops, and he came to watch me warp. And he said, exactly the question you just asked, how much do you weave? And I said, do you mean like how much am I sitting at the loom throwing the shuttle or how much am I thinking about weaving? And he said, well, throwing the shuttle. I said, oh, that varies. It could be 10 hours a week. If I'm preparing for a big show, it could be 30 hours a week. He said, well, how often are you thinking about weaving? I'm like, all the time. I dream about weaving. I think about weaving when I'm driving my car. Don't tell my boss, but I think about weaving when I'm at work. <laughs> so it's it's a passion for me. And once it got its hooks in me, I've never been able to loosen them. And even at the most stressful points in my life, when I've been the least able to spend time at my loom actually producing cloth, I've never stopped thinking about it and dreaming about it and planning and designing and wondering what if this and what if that. So. The answer is a lot of time. Is it kind of like Tetris? Do you watch the threads move in your head? Hmm. Do you know what I'm asking? When I played too much Tetris, I I could like I would close my eyes and the the shapes would drop and I would pivot them in my head. Well, not exactly. I do know exactly what you mean, because that happened with Tetris for me, too. What happens is (laughs) if I'm in full on production mode and weaving a lot of hours, I will get in bed and I will feel the thump of the beater and the movement of my hips and legs on the treadles. Just like if you've been on a boat for a long time, you get on dry land, you can feel the swells of the water. And I'll know I'm lying absolutely still in bed and I can feel the muscles moving as if I'm still throwing the shuttle. Now, I don't really see the threads moving in my head. The biggest problem I have, if it's if you want to call it a problem, is that I get an idea and I have to get up and write it down because otherwise it, it escapes me. And it's like, well, then I got to go to the computer and see if it really works. And will the floats work? And Sometimes I wish I could picture the threads better in my head than I do. I need to actually see them either with a pencil and paper and graph paper or thank heavens for weaving software. Because if I had to draw out all my ideas on graph paper and fill in the little squares like they did pre-computer days, I would be very sad. (laughs) It seems like weaving software has really changed the way a lot of weavers approach their work. Is that something that's happened in the same sort of time frame as WeaveTech? Yes, I would say that it has. And and here's what I've observed. You know, there there may be other weavers out there who disagree with me. But initially, when I was first weaving, I was introduced to each weave structure as this is X and it would have a name like summer and winter. And it came with a threading, a tie up and a treadling. And I was taught initially that each structure was the result of a unique combination If I wanted to weave lace, I needed this threading, this tie up and this treadling. And in the late 1990s, when I and I don't remember, I'm sorry, the exact year, but whatever year Convergence was in Atlanta, I signed up for a three day workshop with Bonnie Inouye. And she introduced me to the concept of threading, treadling and tie up being unique elements. But they in and of themselves didn't create anything until you combined them and created an interlacement. And the interlacement told you what the structure was. 
And what where some of that came from was some of the early exploration into two tie unit weave, where people realized there were different threadings that could result in the same structure. Like, oh, and that's when I started to play with what happens if I take this twill threading and apply this different twill treadling and a totally different tie up and started to mix and match them sort of like, you know, Mr. Potato Head with all the different noses and the ears and all those kinds of things. And I think that it was the partially the freedom of weaving software that allowed us to do that. Because if you've ever drawn out, I remember drawing out my first double weave it was just layer interchange double weave draft on graph paper with a lot of erasers. It took a couple hours. It was a very good learning experience. I strongly encourage any weavers who are just starting out to get familiar with doing it by hand before they get the software. But as I said, if, if that I was limited to just that, the ideas would come and go, but whether I actually got around to putting them on paper, that's a big if. But because we have the speed that weaving software provides, and I, when I think of weaving software, I think of the gift being even more than driving the looms. It's in the ability to, what if this, what if that, and draw three different drafts in 10 minutes, as opposed to 10 hours and several erasers. <laughs> and that allowed us to try things which may have crossed Mary Meigs Atwater's brain but she just didn't have the time to draft them all. And so we got expansive with our, what if this, what if that? And because of that expansiveness of thinking, we have started to push the boundaries on weaving in ways that other weavers in before our time weren't able to. And also the second piece of that is we do have computer driven looms. And if you've ever tried to do a complicated even just a complicated four shaft treadling, the human brain struggles to really master the treadling when it's non-repeating and not a logical sequence. And there's only so much stickies you can put on the castle of your loom to keep track of. And, and there's only so many hours a day when you've got the kind of mental acuity that it takes to concentrate that well. And even though weaving on a computer-aided loom is not brainless, I have to still watch and go, yeah, that doesn't look right. I think it didn't, it didn't lift the shafts I thought it was lifting or whatever. It still allows me to weave things that my brain literally couldn't hold on to. Now, that said, I also strongly advocate people who are really interested in understanding weaving to weave on a table loom where you are lifting each shaft individually. I have a 16 shaft table loom. It's a Purrington brand. I love it. And there's nothing that speeds the understanding I have of a structure more than weaving it on a table loom. Because I have to literally think, do I want this one up or down one at a time rather than the tie ups that you get with a floor loom? You know, I realized that one of the things about weaving software is that although you can certainly still make a mistake while threading and treadling, I would make a mistake in transposing in, in, in drawing. And at least it takes that part out of it so that, you know, at least it takes one class of mistakes you can make off the table. Well, and absolutely. And I think about um, one of my first experiments in double weave. This was a long, long time ago, and I did draw it out. And it wasn't the first draft I ever did in pencil and paper on double weave, but it was the second one. And it was some inspired by a weaver out of from Australia who taught at a convergence that I attended. And she did two layers of cloth that were only held together kind of down the middle. So it was a scarf with sort of wings, like butterfly wings on both sides and a stripe down the middle where the bottom layer was on top and the top layer was on bottom that held those two together. And I drafted it out. I can still picture my desk covered with eraser dust. And I got it all figured out. And I put a warp on my HF loom and I wove it. And I was so pleased with myself. And then I took off the finished fabric and it came apart in two pieces. So I had clearly not gotten it. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> and, and I was like, well... And then I went back and I put that same draft into the computer and went, well, duh, I can see a big, long sections here that are not connected. 
So I couldn't see it on the paper, but I could see it when I was able to take the computer draft and flip it over. You know, there's a nifty little, I use Fiberworks most of the time. There's a nifty little button that says back and it just flips the fabric over for you. And all of a sudden I could see clear as day that they weren't connected. But when I did it on paper and pencil, I sure didn't see that. And I wove that whole warp off and then couldn't figure out why they just fell apart at the end into two pieces of fabric. <laughs> But I will tell you, there's also a mistake that you can make with, with weaving software that is not as easy to make when you're doing it with pencil and paper. And I tend to blame this on my cats more than on me, but you can just be working away and all of a sudden something looks really, really strange. And it's not the way you thought it should. And if my mouse's pointer is up, located up in the tie up and my cat happens to like step on it, they put a little dot in the tie up that I didn't put there intentionally. And all of a sudden the pattern doesn't look anything like I thought it did. And in fact, nothing like it looked 10 minutes ago. You have to look back and say, did somebody step on the keyboard? Did somebody step on the mouse? <laughs> so yes, you get rid of some errors. You have the potential to make others, but it's easy to erase too. For people who haven't seen a computer assisted loom, what exactly does it do? I mean, how do you feed it? And then what is it do for you? How do you give it directions? There's two different ways you can give it directions. Very basically, there is a box that connects, usually via solenoids, each of the individual shafts to a program. Now, that program can be manual, in which case it's bars of wood with pegs in it that click through and tell the loom, okay, this one's up or this one's down. I mean, if you back up a step and think about it, in weaving, no matter how many shafts you have, there's only two places each shaft can be, up or down, which is why it is so perfect for computer. I mean, that's where computers came from, is, is thinking about the binary nature of that. And so there's manual pegging, which then lets, lets the loom know, oh, I want this one up and the one next to it down. Or in the case of computer-driven ones, they're solenoids. And it's the same thing. The solenoid connects to the program and the program is sending a one or a zero to say either up or down. And what that allows me to do is if you stop and think about it, there's exponential numbers of combinations. If you have four shafts, I can have you know one at a time, I can have two at a time, and I can have three at a time, but I really can count on two hands the number of combinations with those four shafts. With 40, the number of possible combinations is astronomical. And rather than trying to, I mean, if you think about eight shaft floor looms, typically have 10 treadles. And even so, it's easy to come up with a draft that requires more than 10 treadles, where you have to weave with two feet or you weave with two feet and a broomstick <laughs> should get three treadles to go down at a time. And if you go to 40, which is five times that many, there's literally not enough room to have that many treadles. So you really have to have a computer to control what's going up and what's going down. And then the very last step where I have not gone is jacquard weaving, where each individual thread is programmed to go up and down. So instead of having a group of threads on shaft one, a group of threads on shaft two, all the way up to 40, you can control each individual thread. It's interesting. I haven't heard of a lot of people asking if people who weave jacquard are, are real weavers. Actually, there is an element of that out there. And I think you probably, I mean, I think it's less heard in weaving circles, primarily because there are far fewer jacquard weavers out there. Let me put it this way. Jacquard weavers in the hand weaving community. There are lots of jacquard weavers, but that's the factories. That's who's designing and uh, weaving the upholstery in your doctor's office. Almost all of that in airplane upholstery, all of that's jacquard woven, and it's all woven in factories in China. Designing for jacquard is a whole nother animal, and I don't quite honestly understand it terribly well. That said, there is an influx of jacquard weaving into the hand weaving community. It's very, very small. If there's only a small number of us that are members of complex weavers relative to the overall weaving community, the number of jacquard weavers is even smaller. And yet there is still an element of every time there's an exhibit. Well, do we include jacquard weaving? Do we want to count that as real? I noticed that one of the people presenting at seminars this year is Patrice George, who is a teacher of weaving. But one of the things she does is also design for industry and teach at FIT where people are probably going to be working in a more commercial setting. So it's an interesting crossover there. 
Yes, it is. And I've taken a couple of seminars with her at Complex Weavers and learned about how she designed hospital, those curtains that go between hospital beds and a, a joint room. It's a very interesting discussion to have with an industrial designer because their parameters are so different from a hand weaver. Yes, we want our dish towels to dry dishes. And yes, if we're going to sew with it, we need to make it sewable. But we are often primarily attracted to something because it's beautiful. And they need to take into account much more of the practical and the cost measures as well as whether it's beautiful or at least appealing. Sometimes she said you don't go for beauty, you just go for it's appealing. But yeah, it is a very interesting crossover. And there's another whole segment of the weaving world that I would say hand weavers in my group as that meaning guild members and people who um, attend regional conferences have not crossed over very much with. And that's the fine art weavers, the ones who get their MFA. And um, I've never forgotten a dress that I saw at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville back when we had the Midwest Weavers Conference there in 2001. And it was a beautiful floor length ball gown woven in double weave and each one of the pockets had a penny in it. And it was a statement about the cost of couture fashion. It was a beautiful piece. However, the model who wore it at one point said, you can't wear it for more than about 20 minutes because it was so heavy. But there's another whole community of hand weavers out there who are weaving truly for fine art and don't really care whether that piece of cloth dries dishes or can be sewn into a jacket. They're making statement pieces and pieces for galleries. So there's that group. There's the, you know, the group that I belong to where we're weaving practical things, but we're still trying to make them items of beauty. And then there's the whole commercial endeavors that Patrice has been a part of for her whole career, which is another whole group. So speaking about classes at seminars, there was one that I noticed on the list called chorus weaving. And I only recently found out that that has something to do with you. It is actually a weave effect. One of the areas that has received in hand weaving that's received a lot of attention in recent years is parallel threadings. And parallel threadings can be woven as several different structures. And Marian Stubinitsky from the Netherlands published a gorgeous four-color book, self-published a gorgeous four-color book that really attracted a lot of attention. This was a number of years ago. And Marco and I were part of the second round of, she had a translator, um, and then Marco and I did read the translation to make sure it kind of made sense from an American weaver's point of view. And in doing that, it raised a lot of questions. And Margaret Co is, and she will admit that she's ADHD when it comes to weaving. So she is forever bouncing down a rabbit hole of something here or there. And I'm much more methodical, but I have the same kind of curious brain. And we both noticed that there was an artifact that these parallel threadings often resulted in warp threads that didn't seem to go straight. Now, in lace weaving, you want that. But in the kinds of weaving that we were doing with these parallel threadings after Marion published her book, we were like, well, what if we don't want it to do that? What controls that? And that got us into digging through all of the different factors that control what the threads are doing when you have parallel threading lines. And she went down one rabbit hole and I went down another rabbit hole and we both did some test weaving and we came up with some ways to approach designing with parallel threadings to eliminate that particular artifact. And she wanted to teach it. And I said, great, go right ahead. But then we had to come up with a name for it too, because otherwise it was way too long an explanation for the title of a class. One of her um, students or collaborators said, well, why don't you call it Chorus for Margaret Co and Amy Norris? And I'm like, that's fine by me. So that's where that came from. And she's out on the circuit teaching it. And I am still experimenting and sampling. And when I have something that I think she can use, I feed it to her to experiment with further. Speaking of collaborating with other weavers, I took a class with John Malarkey once in six hole card weaving, and it was the first time he'd ever taught it to a group. But all throughout the class, as he was teaching it, he said, Amy told me to be sure that I said this. 
And what came out was that you are his his demo student. I, I don't know whether I would say guinea pig. You're oh, the dress I would rehearsal. say guinea pig. Yes, I would say guinea pig for sure. <laughs> <laughs> John Malarkey and I have a wonderful relationship, and it's really unique to me in that his weaving and my weaving could not be more different. He is almost exclusively a tablet weaver. I am a loom controlled weave structure junkie with multi shaft looms. His weaving and my weaving don't look anywhere at all alike. And yet there's something about the way our two brains work that we're always bouncing ideas off each other and getting ideas that take each of us respectively to new levels. And one of those kinds of discussions resulted in him saying, hey, can I test my classes on you? Because I am, I will admit, I am not a tablet weaver, not in any way, shape or form. And so he comes and tries to teach me the absolute novice when it comes to tablet weaving. And he figures if he can teach me and I ask good questions, he can then take it out on the road and teach other people. But yeah, that six hole card class was that was challenging. I am used to having a nice shed. And uh, I kept saying, John, there's not a good shed here. There's not a good shed. How do I know where to put my shuttle? I remember that. And he said, Amy told me to make sure that I said you have to wiggle the cards here. And it really helped. Well, he, he and I work well together and I appreciate his, the opportunity to play in card weaving with him without having to like go all in on it myself. But he certainly has a talent in that area and I'm glad I'm not competing with him. So you work with just a huge number of weavers through Weave Tech and Complex Weavers and MAFA. It seems like you invest a lot of time in serving this weaving community. That's important to me. Um, and, and I'm actually in the process right now of pulling back a little bit after 20 years of being all in in multiple organizations. Not that I'm going anywhere. It just I had gotten to the point where there was a little bit too much for me. But I, I feel strongly that the only way that we can encourage the next generation of weavers is to continue to have the structures in place so that they know they're not alone. And it's an interesting time right now because unlike when I learned to weave in the late 1980s, it was me and my loom and learning to weave with Debbie Chandler, Debbie Redding. My book says Debbie Redding and now says Debbie Chandler. And I was lying on the floor, trying, turning my head every which way, trying to get oriented the same way the one single static picture in the book was in order to figure out whether I was doing it right. Now there's YouTube and, you know, movies and video that shows you from every possible angle which way to warp the loom. And then on the top of that, you can get on to the Internet 24-7, ask a question, and be reasonably confident that you will get a reply in fairly short order. Maybe not instantaneously, but within a reasonable amount of time. And in fact, you'll probably, especially if you're on Facebook and some of the weaving groups, get multiple answers from multiple points of view. The challenge today is to know what kind of input you're getting and which ones to take seriously and which ones may be a little suspect. But the level of available information just staggers me compared to what it was in the late 1980s when I learned to weave. But at the same time, weaving is inherently a solitary activity. I can't really like have a conversation when I'm weaving like I do when I'm spinning. We don't get together with our looms and hang out in a group. So it behooves us to find other ways to form community. And as much as I respect the fact that there's a lot of weavers on Facebook, I also think the face-to-face -face interaction, the ability to see cloth in person, the ability to go back and forth without there being any lag of communication is vital. And so my commitment is to the local groups, to the regional groups, and to the international groups that I think need to stay and need to be as much a part of our future as the internet is. The whole idea of a guild is something that I don't hear too much about anymore, except for weaving and to a lesser amount, spinning or, or knitting. So the guild system of mentorship and connection, it's hard to believe in a way that it still exists after all of these hundreds of years. 
True. And I think we're also in the process now of reinventing guilds because they cannot be just the purveyor of knowledge and mentorship anymore since that knowledge is out there in a thousand other places for people to access at their own convenience. Um, over the duration of my membership in the St. Louis Weavers Guild or Weavers Guild of St. Louis to use our official title, which is the oldest guild west of the Mississippi. We will be 100 years old in just a couple of years. But I have gone from being the chair of an evening meeting that we had specifically for the purposes of trying to attract people who worked full time while there was the full day meeting on Tuesdays when no working person could attend to a point where we're now having Saturday meetings, which can then be equal opportunity for working and non-working members. And then with the um, pandemic, the last couple of years, moving to Zoom, which has allowed people who are no longer either able or willing to drive or the weather is inclement to allow people to attend, even if it's not as convenient for them to drive to, to the physical meeting. So I think there's a lot of um, opportunity right now, and I'm not really quite clear on what how the guilds can best serve the weavers. I don't think it's just the dissemination of information, because as I said, that's out there in a thousand other ways. But there is a vital and to me compelling argument for having a community that is more than just, here's the information, now go weave by yourself. That there's a place that we can share our excitement, that we can connect over ideas as well as the, as the products, and that we can also think creatively together. Because, you know, the whole uh, many minds together makes a, makes a greater impact than just a few people thinking on their own. So I, I do think that there's value for the guilds going forward. And I think we're in a moment of great uh, reinvention and transformation. Well, and as you said, the fabric is something that we can't really get without being in person together. That's so true. You can't tell if something has a good hand unless you have it, can hand it across. Although having said that, we've worked out ways in these enforced COVID times to hold up a piece of fabric and scrunch it in your hands and shake it around and you can see how well it moves. Now, no, it's not the same as getting your actual hands on the actual fabric, but you know, we've gotten pretty creative in the last couple of years. And I really hope that we use the compensation that we've tried to figure out for not being together, that we use that to expand what we're able to offer our communities now that we're able to go back to some in-person as well as online. I actually attended the Mid-Atlantic Conference in last June, June of 2021, which took a regional conference and made the whole thing online. And I was incredibly impressed with how valuable it was. Would it take the place 100% of an in-person weaving conference? Absolutely not. But it was no poor country cousin either. It was very valuable. There was a lot of community. It was exciting. I came away with ideas. I came away wanting to go back to my loom. So there was so much value to that. And my hope is that we can use what we've learned in the last couple of years about remote teaching and online meetings and use that to grow the offerings so we can reach the people who are either physically not able to attend our meetings or schedule wise can't yet people who have young children. There's a lot of reasons that people go to YouTube or the internet or online uh, teaching at, you know, nine o'clock in the evening when it's convenient for them, because that's the only space they have in their life. And I want to encourage that and also find ways to bring people together for the benefits that that provides. Actually, I think Colorado Weaver's Day this year is also wholly online. So it, it's a regional event. But at the same time, we have guests from all over and there are and it's open to people from all over. And it reminds me of some of the things I used to find in the handwoven library, handmade books that were, say, bound up at Kinko's or something like that. But they had swatches in them, handmade swatches, and they were very personal, very individual. And it made me realize how special that was. You would make up a series of these books and send them to people. Here's what I've been doing. Here's a swatch for you. And there's actually still quite a, a number of, of weavers who send woven Christmas cards. You can buy cards at the stationery shop that have a cutout and you just slide your little piece of green fabric in there. And you've got a little Christmas tree then with a die cut Christmas tree in the card. And then there was a whole phase for a number of years where people were making handwoven calendars 
not true calendars, but book of days where you want to keep track of birthdays and the things that are from the same from year to year. And they would weave fabrics to slide in in the pockets for each month. And then there was another guild project from, I'm thinking somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, I'd have to go down to my library and look for it, that did a cookbook that did a dish towel design for each a section of recipes. So yeah, there were, there's there been a lot of that over the years. And some of those pieces are, are treasured items in my, in my weaving library, because there's just something about holding one of those swatches and knowing that another weaver, just like me, worked their loom through the shuttle, treadled this pattern, that it was all touched in the same way that I touch each uh, strand of what I'm working on. So speaking of what you're working on, what do you have on your loom and what do you have on your screen? Well, on or my I guess I should say, what do you have on your loom and what do you have on the drawing board? <laughs> I have on my looms, I have on my four shaft loom, I have towels in Bumberay and 8-2 cotton. I find those to be just a delightful way to play with color. The Bumberay structure with its stripes of three ends of each color allows me a lot of flexibility mathematically to play with what colors look like with each other and with and with themselves, if you if you will. So that's fun. And then on my HF loom, I have a rep project with a hand painted with some hand painted warps from Catherine Weber of Blazing Shuttles. She came or she she didn't come. She sent big boxes of warps and um, hand dyed skeins to us for a very colorful trunk show that our local guild held sort of in the depths of the pandemic in 2020 when we were all just holding on for dear life. And I so I, I picked up some warps from that and have, are doing some rep weave. And I just took off of my 40 shaft samples and also dish towels for a study group that I'm in. And we did um, this year. It was to be something woven inspired by Annie Albers. And I took one of her rug designs and married the rug design idea with uh, parallel threadings and a kind of an interesting tie up that I'd seen on somebody's blog and (laughs) came up with some samples. And I wove them in Sally Fox's um, naturally colored cotton, which I love. And since, you know, once you're warping the loom, you might as well warp it for more than just the samples. So I wove uh, about 15 yards. And so I've got some dish towels after all the samples are cut up. So that's what's on the looms. And I'm looking to my next parallel threading experiment, which is actually, I haven't decided. It's either going to be parallel threadings using the chorus effect for the purpose of creating something that looks like water um, ripples, underwater ripples. I'm picturing scuba diving when I was did some scuba diving in Mexico and watching the way the sunlight came through the top of the water to the sand down below. So that's one idea I'm working on. And then the second one is interleaving two different design lines in a non-parallel threading, which is something I'm working on as part of a study group that I'm in in Chicago. So yeah, dabbling here and dabbling there. And that that's, of course, what I'm thinking about right now. So if you'd asked me this in 24 hours, I might be thinking about something completely different. You never know. Well, thanks so much, Amy. I will see you this summer and I hope you have some happy weaving in the meantime. Great. And I will look forward to seeing you too. Thanks to Trainway Silks for sponsoring this episode. Thank you for listening to the Long Thread Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again.